might talk uh, this evening a little bit about um, uh, bodhisattvas and arahants. And uh, of course, in, in Buddhism, this being one of the, uh, the uh, long standing family arguments in Buddhism is uh, which one's better? Okay, so if you think about you know like a wrestling match with the bodhisattva versus the arahant, you know you've got to think like the bodhisattva is like a sumo wrestler. Okay, he's kind of big and you know big and stuff, and then and then, then the, the the arahant's this kind of thin, wiry like Thai kickboxer or something like that. And they're, they're, that's, this is the kind of the battle. It's almost like a mismatch. You, how are they going to, which one's going to beat the other? Well, you, it's hard to say because they, they embody kind of different qualities. And, uh, of course, this battle being something which is entirely waged in the Buddhist imagination, okay? It's not being waged by bodhisattvas and arahants, right? <laughs> I've never actually seen them waging these kinds of battles, but those who are probably not either bodhisattvas or arahants themselves like to uh, worry about these kinds of things. And uh, the reason I was kind of... Uh, one of the reasons I uh, thought of this was because, uh, as I mentioned before, my very good friend, Venerable Jyoti Dhammo, just came back to the monastery, and he's a uh, monk I've known for 10 years or so. And... Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's very lovely to see he's uh, just returned from a period in the in the jungles of Sri Lanka, and uh, of course I, I was teasing him about you know being a Hinayanist and following the Arahant path and so on. And uh, this, but this is kind of teasing, but also this kind of uh, that that teasing. Um, I was kind of you know. Disguising my own sense of like, oh, I wish I was there, you know, <laughs> and uh, wouldn't it be really nice? And kind of thinking, oh, I remember when I was in the middle of the jungle and didn't have a monastery to look after, and something to be said for that, you know. And uh, so he's he's. Uh, it's interesting how you know we have this idea, you know, like if you think monk. Right, we have this projection of what a monk is, you know, and and it's sort of, you know, the, the hermit or the kind of living in a cave and these kinds of things. And it's remarkable how rare it is, you know. You could probably find maybe one in a thousand if you're lucky, maybe one in ten thousand, probably about one in a thousand monks actually live like that. And. Uh, Of course, you know, when we, 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 we uh, make these dichotomies between somebody who wants to actually uh, help the world, save the world, yeah, and somebody who wants to save themselves. Uh, and the reality is that you can't separate these things, okay? So, <coughs> you can emphasize one or the other. But you can't completely separate them, and uh, it was interesting. Like when when Venerable uh, uh, Jodhidharma was talking, telling his stories about uh, his his uh, forest experiences in in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, one of the experiences he, he he heard, or one story he heard from a very senior monk, and there's a very uh, senior Western monk who's living in Sri Lanka, uh, Venerable Nyanadipa, and uh, he's not very well known outside of Sri Lanka or even outside of that very small area. But he's just been a true hermit for like 40 years or so. Uh, he's just been living in the very deep jungle, and. Uh, And so he's like a really a true recluse, yeah. And uh, many many stories about him and his adventures and so on. Uh, but 
he, he, I mean, he's, he's been through many occasions. He was, he was um, trampled by an elephant on one occasion and different kinds of things. So he's many different adventures that he's had. Uh, and uh, Venerable Jody Dhamma sort of heard all, kind of all these adventures and he asked him, like, Bhante, you know, we, 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 did, you, did you get scared when these things happened? And he said, no, no, not really. And then he said, well, well was there any time when you were scared? He said, well, there was one time, yeah, when he was scared. He was, he was sitting outside his kuti and uh, sitting meditation, <clears throat> just outside. And, um, and then there was this kind of movement. Something was kind of moving. It was like an animal was, was coming near him or touching him or something like that. And uh, he just stayed there, stayed sitting. Because, you know, in, the, in Sri Lankan jungles, there's still very good wildlife, you know, and uh, lots of elephants and bears and leopards and all kinds of things. So it could have been anything, but this thing is kind of thing, and okay. And then gradually he realized that it was a snake, and he kind of opened his eyes, and it was a cobra, a big black cobra crawling up him as he was sitting there in meditation. He wasn't scared yet. Right? <laughs> that wasn't what made him scared, all right? And then, then the cobra sort of coming up. And then he looked and he realized that there was a hawk just nearby on the ground, hopping around. Yeah? And he realized that the hawk must have been after the cobra. Yeah? Yeah? And the cobra was trying to get up to a tree. He was sitting under a tree. Yeah? And so it's like the cobra had come to him for refuge. Yeah, he was sitting there. And the cobra, he was a place of safety. The cobra was seeking him out for safety. So oh, that's all right. Then the cobra sort of crawled up and then was trying to get up to the tree. Hawks are around trying to get the cobra. And, uh, but the, it's, the trees, the branch is too far away. The cobra can't get up there. And so very, very carefully, as you can imagine, right? Very mindfully. <laughs> it's a, that's that time when mindfulness starts to get very sharp. Very mindfully, he, he just kind of very gradually raised his hand. And he wanted to lift his hand up so that the, the cobra would be able to, to climb up to the thing, raising his hand. And when he did that, he raised it to a certain amount and the cobra got startled and just went <laughs> like that and was just there ready to go. And, you know, they can spit into your eyes and these kinds of things. At that moment, he got scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the cobra was ready to strike, and he was just looking there. The cobra's there. Hawk's there. Right, wanting to get the cobra. Cobra's there wanting to get him. He's there wanting to get out. And he just stayed there. So that's a real test of mindfulness, isn't it? <laughs> it's good, isn't it? It would be good if you could, you could teach this at a meditation retreat, wouldn't it? What do you think? It's not, not these kind of repeatable, that you can't kind of make a system out of it, you know? Okay, everyone, there's a cobra cage. You can't, you can't, um, you can't um, normalize it, you know? There you go. Okay, there he is sitting with the cobra. He's, his hand up. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> And eventually the cobra just, just calmed down and then just crawled up his hand into the tree. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, and it's very interesting to hear, hear the kind of stories about uh, people practicing in that way and, and uh, you know, just to realize how uh, you know, how uh, on the edge and living on the edge our Dhamma practice has to be, you know. And I was kind of, one, used to ask myself this when I was in, living in Thailand, and when I was a young monk, you know, and, and, you know, most of the time I was living, I did spend time living in the jungles and so on myself, but, but um, that's like periods of time. It's slightly different if you go there for a period of time. Well, you know, you can always leave. 
And uh, I would kind of wonder, like, what, you know, when we read these stories, you know, the, the great Arjuns and their encounters with this, the tigers and the, the snakes and so on, and, well, what is it for me? You know, what's my tiger? Yeah? What's my cobra staring at me in the face like that? Yeah? What, what is it that, makes, that can make the Dhamma as real as that? Yeah? And as alive as that? Yeah? Because that moment when you're on the verge of death, that's actually when you're the most alive. Yeah? Yeah? Life is not something you value until that happens, until you're staring face to face with a, a, a cobra. And uh, so another one, one of the stories Venerable Jodi Dhamma told me was he, he said he was, he, he was staying at this very remote monastery, an old cave monastery, so many hundreds of ancient cave monasteries in Sri Lanka. And he'd heard a story. There was a mountain over, over there, and it was all just national park, no one living there at all. And it was like half a day's walk away, another mountain with another thousand-year-old cave temple there with no one there and no one had visited there or lived there for a thousand years and he wanted to go and visit it so he started walking and walking during the day and there was elephant droppings all over the place so I knew that you know the place is full of elephants there's no humans there and he's just following elephant tracks there weren't any other tracks to follow and he's walking <coughs> much of the morning and walking through very high grass and he came to a point, he'd been walking about half the day, and he came to a point where at the path, and then next to the path was a large rock. Okay? And as he was walking past this large rock, this feeling came up in his mind, oh, you should climb up that rock. And he said, oh, no, I've got to get on, I've got to get to the place I'm going to. And he walked a few more steps, and then the feeling came back again very strongly. Best, best to climb up that rock. And he thought, well... Okay, so he kind of turned around and uh, scrambled up the rock. And when he turned around from scrambling up the rock, it only took a couple of seconds, and an elephant stepped out of the grass right where he'd been standing before. He said he, he couldn't hear it at all. The elephant had been just there, and it's totally silent. He couldn't hear it at all and just stepped onto the path right there. And then they just kind of looked at each other. He looked at the elephant, the elephant looked at him. And... Uh, and then the elephant just went on his way. And then he, he reflected to himself. He thought, it's, it's just getting, this is getting a bit too dangerous. I thought I'd be able to hear them coming at least, right? And he, <laughs> but he, they're so silent. He thought, no, this is just too dangerous. I'm going to have to go back. So he turned around to go back. But the elephant with some others had gone back the way that he'd gone. So they're now in front of him as he was on his way back. And he, he couldn't get past them. And he kept on trying to get around the path and, and couldn't get. And he came to a big open grassland area. And uh, is crossing that. And then just out of there came a big uh, herd of elephants, about 20 of them or so, and all making a lot of noise and trumpeting and, and you know, crashing and everything like that. And they were right in front of him. And again, there was, there was a rock nearby, and he thought, well, I'd better, better seek refuge, you know. Because, of course, theoretically, you just spread metta and then they all go, oh, okay, and they bow down at your feet like they did for the Buddha, yeah? So you can try that, yeah? But sometimes discretion is the better part of metta as well. So he climbed up the thing and then they saw him and he was up the rock and they all charged. And so they, they literally stampeded this herd of 20 elephants all trumpeting with their ears out and their, 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 their trunks up and they're st charging towards him, trying to trample him. And all around this rock and tr around the rock and everything trying to get him. So it was the second time he just escaped death that day. It was only very quick he managed to get up there. So then he finally they left and he managed to get back to his monastery. And he was a bit exhausted and so on. So he went, said, OK, go up to this bathing place. And he had to climb up some rocks to get to the bathing place. And he climbed up some rocks. And just as he was climbing up, face to face with him with this huge bear. <laughs> and then just appeared. And when the bear saw him, the bear immediately just roared and started running at him. And so he, <laughs> he sort of <laughs> turn, turned in, in midair, leaping off the rock and stumbling down, falling down the slope and so on. And, and the bear was sort of standing where he'd been half a second before and just kind of snarling down at him and so on.
Yeah. And that bear used to live, live, live there. So when he was staying there in that kuti, the bear would sort of come past and rub itself on the outside of the rock outside of his hut. So he'd be sitting in the hut and this bear would be. <laughs> so anyway, he had some, there's three, three escapes that one day. So you're starting to lose, you're using up your, your, your merit pretty quickly in those kinds of uh, situations, you know. And, uh, you know, I really respect what he's doing. Of course, he's not, um, he's not just doing this for the sake of it, you know. He's not just saying, I want to, you know, see lots of wildlife or be in dangerous situations. He's not doing like a Steve Irwin or anything like that. He's going there because he wants to meditate, yeah. And because there's this feeling in him that whatever it takes, yeah, whatever it takes to be able to meditate, be able to see the Dhamma, then that's all that matters. Uh, and if these things happen, then that's okay. And uh, it was interesting, he was talking about Venerable Nyanadipa, who's this kind of very confirmed recluse living in the jungles for, for about 40 years. And he said these days he, he comes out maybe one, for one week uh, in a year and uh, sees people and talks to them and these kinds of things. And, uh, and then he goes back into the forest. So he said last year he came out and he, 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 he read one book, which was my book, History of Mindfulness. <laughs> so that was quite funny. So, which he said was interesting. And that's it. And it goes back into the forest again. And uh, so it, it's interesting that there's, there's this little leakage, Yeah. So even though he's the most reclusive monk you can imagine, has been to 40 years. Like, I mean, you know, we think doing a weekend retreat is pretty good, yeah? 10-day retreat is, like, really good, you know? And then we think, well, maybe you could do, even do a three-month retreat or something like that. 40 years! And in that whole time, he, he hasn't even lived in a, in a, in a kuti with, with four walls on it, okay? He, he makes these kutis out of mud. They only have three walls, just three walls and a roof, so no windows or doors or anything, three walls and a roof, right? And <laughs> all the elephants and bears and leopards and things are just out the door, yeah? And uh, so, but then, even then, there's still that feeling, oh, okay, well, there's that time, maybe even one week per year, yeah, where well, I'm going to make that available for other people. So there's that kind of thing. And the same like if somebody wants to go to the other extreme, maybe somebody as the bodhisattva extreme wants to just devote themselves completely selflessly to others. But yet there'll be that time, there'll be that moment when they need to withdraw, yeah? and they need to uh, uh, just be with themselves. So this is one of the kind of the mottos that I say in, in the monastery is that if you, when you're staying in the monastery, if we want to, uh, when, when, I, when I go back to stay in my hut and go on retreat, then I do that out of compassion for the welfare of all beings. And when I want to come out and teach others, then I do that to help myself. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because when you're in your hut meditating, yeah, then that sets an example for others. Yeah, and other people are inspired. You know, and if you're staying in the monastery, everyone there is inspired. It helps the practice of everybody, and also it, it enables me to purify my mind, and then that means that I can give better dhamma talks later on, and all of these kinds of things. So that's good. Whereas if I come and coming and teaching, then <clears throat> I also have to try to purify my own mind. You know, it's no good me sitting here te trying to teach dhamma to all you, and then being full of kind of evil wishes and everything like that. So I have to be able to get in touch with the dhamma inside myself, yeah, in order to be able to express it. Yeah, and so this is one reason why I always start the dhamma talk by by doing some meditation. So no matter what I've been doing during the day, then we all sit together. And we can all settle, purify our minds, and then the Dhamma can come out of that. Yeah? And so, if we start to think about it like that, then it starts to break down these, these opposites. Yeah? And to realize that there actually there can't be these extremes. And so, the, the, you know, this whole idea of the Bodhisattva and the Arahant, is, the Bodhisattva versus the Arahant, is, is just a, 
a, a, a construct. As one of my uh, hobbies is um, uh, historical studies, and so if we look at that uh, historically, you know, you can see, of course, what did the Buddha teach? Well, the Buddha taught everyone to become arahants, obviously, <coughs> and that's that's very obvious from the from the early suttas. And so, if you look at the earliest strata of the Buddha scriptures from the Pali Nikayas, the Chinese Agamas, the Sanskrit Agamas, uh, the Buddha just said to, to practice and be an arahant, basically. There's no mention, hardly even mention of a bodhisattva. There's certainly no mention, there's nowhere where the Buddha says you should be a bodhisattva or you should practice a bodhisattva path, and nor is there anywhere where the bodhisattva path is taught in a way that's different from what the Buddha himself practiced, Okay. And the Buddha is very explicit about that. He says, you know, I got my enlightenment by practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. And you too should get your enlightenment by practicing that same Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah? So it's not at all ambiguous or unclear. It's very straightforward. And in those earliest texts, um, the, <coughs> uh, the usage of the word Bodhisattva seems to be, from the earliest times, restricted to only um, Siddhartha Gautama, our Buddha, before he was a Buddha, when he had left the home and was striving for, for release while he was practicing in, in the jungles. Okay? And so that seems to be um, the earliest usage of the word Bodhisattva. And uh, these days... Uh, we've become so used to the meaning of the word bodhisattva, bodhisattva, or bodhisattva in Sanskrit that it's difficult for us to uh, deconstruct this or to look at it from another perspective. But actually, in um, both the Tibetan and Chinese traditions, there's a memory of an explanation for the word bodhisattva, which is not actually bodhisattva, but is bodhisattva. And shakta means one who is dedicated to or intent upon. Okay? So bodhisattva means a, a, an enlightenment being. So it suggests that somebody whose being is enlightenment. And that's how it's usually interpreted by the later traditions. But it seems possible, not certain, but possible, that in the earliest times it was bodhisattva, which meaning someone who's dedicated for enlightenment, somebody who's putting their life on the line, for enlightenment, and that's what the earliest meaning was. And certainly that very well describes uh, that period of striving when the, bodh when the Bodhisattva was in the jungle. So, of course, according to the, the cliché, you know, what my friend Venerable Jodi Dhammo and, the, and those other monks are doing is, is the, the quote-unquote, the Arahant path, yeah? It's living in the middle of the jungle, not seeing people, not talking, and so on. But, in fact, that's actually what the Bodhisattva did, isn't it? That's what Siddhartha did when he, when he left home. It's precisely what he did. He went into the jungle, stayed by himself, and, and it talks about his, the level of seclusion he practiced. He said, you know, so secluded I wouldn't even talk to anyone. Even if hunters or woodsmen came about, I would run away like a deer running through the forest and disappear so I couldn't talk to them. And uh, that kind of idea of the Bodhisattva is actually even remembered in some of the early Mahayana scriptures. And so, you know, we... We, we think or we imagine that there's this idea of the Mahayana Bodhisattva as uh, always mixing with people, going out into the world, and so on. But even in some of the Mahayana scriptures, it says the Bodhisattva should live on deserted border areas. They should stay in the deepest parts of the jungle. They should never talk with people. If anyone comes to see them, they should dismiss them. They should not associate. All of these kinds of things. So it's not nearly as black and white or as simplistic as we like to imagine. So I think, I'm just suggesting this, that in the earliest period the word Bodhisattva just meant the Buddha striving, or the, the Buddha to be, striving for enlightenment after he left the home. And gradually came to be extended to his earlier part of his life, and then from there to his previous lives, as told in the various Jataka stories. In the earliest Jataka stories that we have actually in the, the Pali Nikayas, the word bodhisattva is not used. Okay? So the Buddha tells the stories of his past lives, but he doesn't say, 
oh, in that time I was called a bodhisattva. Okay? It just tells the story and what he did in the past lives. So um, it seems to me that over, say, the period of 500 years after the Buddha passed away, that uh, the Buddhist community obviously um, wanted to tell more and more stories about the Buddha. They, they wanted to somehow know more and more about him and to bring more and more things within the framework of Buddhism. And so this is where we get a lot of the, the Jataka stories and other, other tales and so on which have uh, accumulated around the Buddha. And from there, you know, we have this idea in our mind that the Buddha was doing these spiritual practices in the past which was leading to his enlightenment in the present birth. Now, there's two things here. One is karma. Okay? According to the teachings of karma, who we are in this lifetime uh, is largely, not totally, but largely determined by the acts that we've done in the past. Okay? And so if we've done lots of good spiritual practices and so on, then we can expect that that will result in a good potential, good basis in this lifetime. And this is a very general teaching on karma, which is accepted in all schools of Buddhism. So this is one thing. The other thing which was added onto that, uh, which is not nearly as uh, uh, simplistic, is the idea that the Bodhisattva was pursuing a, a deliberate course in spiritual training. Okay? So we say that courses like that we call the paramis or parameters. Okay? And so we, there, there evolved this idea that in particular lifetimes, the being who later became the Buddha had developed specially certain kinds of characteristics. So maybe he developed energy in one particular lifetime, and that was what he did, or another lifetime he developed metta, or another one he developed patience, and so on. And uh, through many, these kind of built up in this kind of program. And uh, that program became accepted in one form within the Theravada tradition, obviously became very central within the Mahayana tradition. It's found in both traditions, but much more centrally placed in the Mahayana tradition. And uh, that, that kind of idea, I think, evolved, say, four, five, six hundred years after the Buddha's Parinibbana. And so it is important to notice that that's not how things are presented in the early suttas. In the early suttas, when the Buddha talked about the spiritual practices he'd done in the past, for example, one sutta he talks about he did Brahma Vihara practice. Okay? So he did uh, metta and attained to a very sublime state of consciousness with that and so because of that he was then reborn in the Brahma realms and stayed in the Brahma realms for many years and after that then the power, the merit of that fell away and then he was reborn in this world okay? so the message of that sutta he was saying first of all is that doing metta is good and it's a powerful thing and you can develop these wonderful states of samadhi but also that it's impermanent okay? so that's the message that he was giving there and he doesn't say, this was how I was building up that barami, which has now fruited in this life. On the contrary, he said, the fruit of that was that rebirth in the Brahma realm, and then that finished. So there's like a line drawn under that. Okay? So it's not saying that he kind of built up in some way to this life. And certainly he's not saying that he was like consciously developing it step by step. So what it seems happened around, say, four, five, six hundred years after the Buddha passed away, is that um, probably in some... What it seems happened is that in the time of King Ashoka, now we're talking 200 years after the Buddha, the Sangha became very, very well endowed, very supported. Yeah? Ashoka was the biggest emperor in the world and he gave incredible support to the Sangha. And so money, wealth, fame equals decadence, corruption, <laughs> downfall <laughs> for spiritual practice. Okay? And so in those centuries afterwards, that seems to be what happened. And you got increasingly wealthy, well-endowed monasteries which would uh, be pursuing kind of erudite Abhidhamma studies and all of these kinds of things which didn't really relate to what people needed. It wasn't communicating with people's actual problems. Yeah? Uh, it's kind of ivory tower idea. And the monasteries are very well supported, very wealthy. 
I mean, to give you an idea of the, how well supported they were, uh, in ancient India, much of our information about ancient India derives from coins, okay? Because from which kings were in which era and which time and which place and so on. We get that information from coins because they're very durable. And almost all the coins that have been found have been found in monasteries. Yeah? So that's something to think about, isn't it? Now, partly that's because the monasteries were very s strongly built so that they could preserve them. Yeah? But it is something to think about. So, you know, you can get this idea of, you know, big monasteries with lots of monks in there, very kind of internal, closed kind of thing, just into their studies and so on and so forth, and not actually helping people all that much. And then there was a breakaway movement, and that breakaway movement is what we now call Mahayana. And they said, you shouldn't do that. What you should do is practice like the Bodhisattva practiced, going into the forest and meditating. Yeah? And so there's a strong emphasis in the early Mahayana scriptures of being a Bodhisattva in the sense of striving for release by practicing meditation in the forest. And it seems like that was part of the earliest Mahayana. Another part of the Mahayana movement was connecting with lay people, connecting with the wider community and so on. So there are many aspects for it. It can't be reduced to just one aspect. And so... When that movement formed, they had to have their own scriptures. Okay? And so this is what we call the Mahayana Sutras. And these were composed from a period, say, four, five, six hundred, up to a thousand years after the Buddha passed away. And where did they come from? Some of them were no doubt uh, just invented. Some of them were maybe compiled after an oral tradition so that the teachings would become known within a community and they would be formulated in a certain way. Some of them would be inspired by meditation experiences. Yeah? Somebody would have a vision in their meditation. The Buddha would come and teach them in their meditation. They think, wow, it's the Buddha. He's come to teach me. Fantastic. They come out and they could write it down. Yeah? And this, it was at this period that writing became very um, uh, prominently used in Buddhist scriptures. Uh, so the Mahayana scriptures were actually the first ones that were written down from the beginning, composed as written texts. And so this was, and part of that movement, it, it, part of that movement, it's interesting because part of it is always like very open and very inclusive. It's all, you know, all sentient beings and lots of metta and so on. But part of it is also very shrill and aggressive and polemical. And they're always attacking, not always, but very often attacking the selfish arahants. Yeah? Oh, these selfish arahants, you know, they're doing this. They don't care about anybody. They don't have compassion. They've got limited wisdom. So there's this kind of interesting dynamic, which, of course, doesn't make sense. If we think of those arahants as being real arahants, it doesn't make sense at all because the real arahants have got rid of greed, hatred, and delusion. They've completely developed their compassion. They're totally full of wisdom. They've embodied the Dhamma to the deepest respect. You can't... It's, it's just ludicrous. It's completely loony to be saying these things about real arahants. But I don't think these scriptures were ever meant to be talking about real arahants. I think they were meant to be talking about those monks in those university kind of monastery things who maybe think that they're arahants, yeah, or who maybe practice a path which is called the arahant path or teach that, okay? Most of those probably were from a school we call the Sarvasti Vardhans, okay? Dead school now, it doesn't exist, but it was very prominent in those days. And most of the Mahayana critiques, it seems, were aimed against the Sarvasti Vardhans and other early schools which don't exist anymore. So this is one thing to remember, that when they were criticising things, they criticised what they call the Hinayana, okay? Hinayana means the crappy vehicle, right? And so these days people say Hinayana is a synonym for Theravada, but that's entirely incorrect because the, 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 you know, the Theravadans were way down in... What we call Theravada was way down in Sri Lanka at that time and most of this activity was happening in the north of India. Okay? So it was actually the attacks and criticisms were levelled against ancient schools of Buddhism which don't exist anymore. And some of those criticisms are probably true in the time and place. Yeah? But it's very misleading if you take them out of that time and place and pretend that they're universal truths. So it's very interesting because by understanding it in this way, we understand the actual dynamics that are going on within the Buddhist community. Yeah? 
And this is the same dynamics that's happening today in our Buddhist community. Yeah? It's the same dynamic I can feel within myself. Yeah? When my friend Jodi Dhammo comes and he's sort of talking about how wonderful it is staying in the forest and all that, and I'm sort of sitting there thinking, oh, yeah. oh, maybe I made a mistake starting Santi Monastery. No, no, I'm sure it's a good thing. No, no, I'm sure it'll be very worthwhile for me. No, maybe I should just throw it all up and go around. And so I can feel that within myself. Yeah? And, you know, but also, he also feels it within himself, yeah? Because, you know, when we were talking and he was saying, you know, I, I really would be liking to, to, to be teaching and helping people, but I just don't feel it's the right time yet, you know, maybe in a few years' time. And, uh, you know, he's starting to feel that with these years of very intensive practice that he's, he's starting to get a depth of meditation which, you know, he would like to be able to share that experience. And uh, uh, when the time is right. And uh, so these things are very, very real. Yeah, we, we feel that within ourselves. And, and you all feel that as well on a daily basis. Sometimes you think, well, I, I want to meditate but, you know, I've got X, Y, Z, I've got to look after the kids, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. How do you find that balance, yeah? Well, you can't find that balance, this is the thing. So if you keep on trying to find it, it's a disaster, right? <laughs> because, because it's not a static thing, it's a dynamic thing, yeah? So you can't, you know, it's like you're trying to find a balance on a, on a tightrope, but somebody's at either end of the tightrope actually wobbling it backwards and forwards, yeah? You can't find one point that's the right point of balance. But what you have to do is learn to be fluid with that and fluid in the moment, yeah? And that way that you can, you can be content with that. And uh, <clears throat> when the Buddha talked about this, it was a very, very beautiful um, way that he would put it. And you can see, as so often in the history of Buddhism and the way that we talk and think and understand about Buddhist doctrines is that as so often that everything comes from a partial presentation of things which were presented more fully and completely by the Buddha himself. Okay? So then of those things the Buddha taught very normally, someone will take up one part of that and present that and say, this is it, this is Dhamma. Somebody takes up another part and presents, this is Dhamma. These look like they're different. Yeah, the two hands look like they're different, but the heart is the same. The heart, they come from the same place. But the two hands can, can fight with each other, but they're actually all connected to the same heart. Yeah? And so in this case, when we look at how the Buddha talked about um, uh, this issue, you know, his very, very beautiful phrase that I always remember, atatang wahi bhikkhuwe sampasamanena, how does it go again? Sampasamanena alameva atama... Oh, my, my, my Pali recollection is no good tonight. Atatangwa hi bhikkhuwe sampasamane na alameva sampadeta alameva apamade na sampadeta paratangwa hi bhikkhuwe sampasamane na alameva apamade na sampadeta ubhayatangwa hi bhikkhuwe sampasamane na alameva apamade na sampadeta for one's own benefit or seeing one's own benefit, yeah, then that in itself is good enough for striving. Yeah? Seeing the benefit for others, that in itself is good enough for striving. Yeah? Seeing the benefit for both, then that in itself is good enough for striving. Yeah? Very, very beautiful. And this is very typical of the way that the Buddha put things. And it always has this threefold pattern. So when we take it in the twofold pattern, is it for myself or for others, then we have that dichotomy. We're always fighting. But the Buddha put it in terms of a threefold pattern, starting with oneself, then to others, and then you're realizing that actually, there's, in the end, there's no difference between yourself and others. Yeah? And so this is the synth synthesizing it. The same pattern... For example, in the, in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha said one contemplates internally, one contemplates externally, one contemplates internally and externally. Yeah? So the same pattern again and again we find in the suttas. And this is breaking down this dichotomy between self and other. Yeah? It's, a, it's relatively true. Okay? So it's relatively true at a certain moment in time, 
we have to make a decision. Am I going to go and sit meditation, look after my own benefit, or am I going to, you know, go and whatever, feed the cat or something like that, do something for somebody else's benefit, yeah? And so relatively at that moment we have to do that. But in a higher sense, those distinctions fall apart, yeah? And so if we keep practicing to the important thing, alameva apamadena sampadeta, just that is enough for striving. Yeah? So the important thing is not so much am I striving for my benefit or another's, but are you actually doing the striving? Yeah? <laughs> and if you're doing that for selfish reasons, me, my suffering, I want to get rid of my suffering, I want to do my practice, that's okay. Right? We shouldn't look down on that because sometimes we need to do that. Yeah? And again, if somebody does it for others, they say, I'm going to do this because I need to help others. And then you might also criticize that. Somebody might say, well, how can you help others and you haven't helped yourself yet? Yeah? And th that's true. But you shouldn't criticize it because they're still helping others. Yeah? And in the end of the day, if we do that, then ubhayatang, for the benefit of both. Yeah? And that's the highest uh, good and the highest benefit. And so we can see this whole dichotomy of the Arahant and the Bodhisattva actually dissolves. It's actually just at a, at a fairly low level of, of comprehension that we, we start to think that these things are different. In reality, somebody who's uh, spiritually um, awake and aware, they're not thinking, am I an Arahant or am I a Bodhisattva or any of these kinds of things. They're thinking, is this good? Is this a good thing to do? Should I be doing this? Is there ignorance in my heart? Can I get rid of this ignorance? So they have this idea, sometimes they put this idea that a bodhisattva is one who voluntarily relinquishes Nibbāna so that they can help all living beings. Yeah? But Nibbāna is just the ending of greed, hatred and delusion. Yeah? So let's rephrase that and put it the other way. I'm going to voluntarily keep greed, hatred and delusion so that I can help all sentient beings. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not how it works. So this is just a piece of rhetoric. okay? And as a piece of rhetoric, it's interpreted and understood in different ways by different people. Okay? So if you ask you know, different Mahayana teachers about that, some will say it's, it's just meant to be a metaphor. You know? It's meant to be inspiring striving. Other people will take it more literally. Yeah? But in my, my feeling is that with a lot of these ideas were originally intended to be part more partial and metaphorical and that later generations tend to, to, to take them much more seriously. And uh, certainly in some cases, they're out and out satires and many of the Mahayana sutras are quite humorous and they're quite satirical and they weren't meant to be taken seriously. <clears throat> uh, so... Uh, this is where we need to, to, to really put the effort and really to keep reflecting on that and remembering that whatever we're doing in that moment, at that time, we have to give 100%. And this is something I always... The best lesson I ever learnt from Ajahn Brahm, my, my teacher, was not about two bricks in the wall, not about how important jhanas are, not about dependent origination. All of those things, yes, are very wonderful. But the best thing I ever learnt from him was his ability to give himself absolutely, totally, 100% to everything that he did all the time. If he's with somebody, he gives himself 100% to that person. If he's doing the accounting, he gives himself 100% to the accounting. I haven't managed to attain that yet. Okay? <laughs> uh. Yeah, I, I kind of given up on that one. But and if he's if he's meditating, he gives himself a hundred percent to his meditation. And he's not talking to somebody thinking, "Oh, if only I was off meditating." And he's not meditating thinking, "Oh, if only I was off talking to someone." Yeah, and that's that that wonderful ability. And then that completely transcends that whole kind of dichotomy. Where are you now? What do you need to do? How do I need to use my mind? Yeah, how can I use this situation here now? right here, most effective way to overcome those defilements that are actually causing me suffering. So this is the question we need to worry about and not the question of am I going to be an Arahant or a Bodhisattva. So this is my little talk for you this evening on Arahants and Bodhisattvas.